And I want to preach today from the subject, Living Against the Odds. Living Against the Odds. Bow your heads for a moment. Almighty God, we're so grateful today for this space that you've allowed us to stand and share in, O oh God. For everything our hearts have felt, we say thank you. For everything our ears have heard, we say thank you. For all that we have witnessed with our eyes, we say thank you. And God, I ask you now, like I've always asked, consecrate now my mind and my will. Sanctify my lips and anoint us that we might hear you speak a word in third. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people of God say amen, amen. and amen. amen. And as you take your seat, just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, amen. I'm living, I'm living against, the against the odds. Amen. Somebody should have shouted. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, there will be times in this life when our faith to believe will be severely tested. So when those moments occur, God wants to bring you and bring us into living in a space of newness that goes against the odds. In case you did not know, let me be the first one to tell you, God specializes in reviving dead things. But all too often we become apprehensive about our futures because the odds seem stacked against us. Jesus, in our text today, gives us a vivid reminder that he still specializes in providing a newness of living that goes against the odds. In John chapter 11, we are introduced to yet another self-declared revelation of Jesus' identity. Last week, Jonathan, he said, I am the bread of life. And here he is now standing in the face of death, hopelessness, emptiness, loneliness, fearfulness, anger, and confusion. And Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone, somebody holler, anyone, anyone. who believes in me will live even after dying. Now, just so we are clear, there, there, this is a story that goes against the odds simply because the crux of the story centers around the reviving of life. This is not a story about restoration because to restore something means to put it back or return. You restore cars. You restore furnitures. This is about revival. Somebody shout revival. Because to revive something means to return to consciousness or to return to life. To become active or to become flourishing once again. Inanimate objects are restored, but once living objects are revived. And that's why Jesus is so significant in the life of every believer. Because every believer must come to a place to understand that there is a difference between being restored and being revived. During those dry, barren seasons of our lives, seasons when our hope has died, our dreams have died, our spirits are dried up and lifeless, we, we don't need restoration. We need a revival. Evangelist Gypsy Smith was asked, well, what is the secret to revival? And, and he said, go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself, then pray, oh Lord, Revive everything inside this circle. You want to tap your neighbor and say, he talk about you, amen. See, see that, that's the key, my brothers and sisters. It, it's not what's around us that needs reviving. When your life is empty and lifeless, it ain't your pocket that needs reviving. It's your soul that needs revival. It's not about getting more money or a new car or a new suit or a new boot. You, you can have all that stuff you want to have, but stuff will never give life to your spirit. We, we need life infused in us, a, a life that promotes a level of newness that stuff can't give you. We, we don't need a regurgitation of what was. We, we need something that's new and fresh taking place in our lives. We, we need God to bring forth a newness of life 
that goes against the odds. I, I wish I had about five of y'all in church today. We, we don't need any more empty political promises. We don't need any more campaign trail niceties. We don't need any more made-for-TV promises of racial reconciliation or healing. No more selling of our souls to the highest bidders, Clarence Thomas. I mean, but we need a a transformative, reviving move of Almighty God. The text gives us hints as to how we can experience a newness of life that goes against the odds. Anybody come to church today and you're just interested in hearing how do you live against the odds? Well, if you want to live against the odds, the first thing you have to do is you have to reaffirm your faith. In verse 22, Martha declares to Jesus, after Jesus arrived, Angela, a day late and a dollar short. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Her, her brother is now dead. Jesus has arrived after the fact. The evidence of death has been presented and the verdict has been declared. The death certificate has been signed off on and the internment is over. But Martha says, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Now, I want you to notice something here, Ms. Weaver. She did not say, we know God will give you. She said, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. This, this is a personal pronouncement of faith that flew in the face of her situation. She had experienced loss and was dealing with the emptiness and the hopelessness that Lazarus' death has now brought her. She, she had lost something dear and close, and now she was facing the reality of life's turbulent moments. And I wonder, did anybody show up in church on Sunday morning and you know something about the turbulent times that life brings your way? She, she was forced to deal with figuring out how to live life now with such pain. But, but she says almost defiantly in the face of death, I know that God will give whatever you ask. By saying, I know, Martha is revealing to us just how important it is to reaffirm your faith in moments of difficulty, distress, and disaster. Life can be hard, life can be hurtful, life can be humiliating, life can be discouraging, life can be depressing, life can be debilitating, but there are moments when we all, when we all have nothing to stand on but the fact that God is still able. I'm gonna give you a chance right there to give God a praise, amen. But is there anybody in church today who still knows that God is still able despite what my circumstances might face with tears running down her face. Her soul is now downcast. Her body is almost numb with pain. She says despite what I'm going through right now, I know that God will listen to you Jesus. Now, now, now it's important to understand something right here because she is making a play foul and she's making a play on the intercessory ministry of Jesus. Because our faith tells us that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession on your behalf. Y'all don't even know when to holler. That, that simply means that, that by reaffirming my faith, my, reaffirming my faith connects me to the possibility that resides in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Say it again, Reverend. I think I will. By reaffirming my faith, it connects me to the possibility of the ministry that Jesus Christ has by sitting at the right hand of the Father. She says, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And I wonder, did anybody show up today and your faith can still declare, I know that God will give Jesus whatever he asks. Now, can I help you understand? Contrary to some of what these preachers tell you today, God is not going to give you everything you ask God. I hate to be the one to tell you, amen. She didn't say God will give me whatever I ask because sometimes I ask contrary to the will of God for the moment. <laughs> but she, she knew enough to know, Ms. Bonison, that God may not give me what I ask for, 
but God will surely give you what you ask for. You, you ought to tap your neighbor and say, stop asking your neighbor, but ask Jesus, amen. See, see, we, we miss the power of what can be quite often because we, we miss the power of the intercessions of Jesus on our behalf. Can I help you understand something? The reason you survived what you survived was not because you prayed the right prayer. It's because your big brother was sitting beside his daddy telling him, watch out for them, cover them, keep them, Hold them, strengthen them, give them some more grace. Is there anybody in church today who knows I am a survivor because Jesus has been praying for me? Mama may have and Papa may have, but blessed be the child that's got his own. Amen. Look, look, we get, we get frustrated and discouraged when God refuses to answer our requests at times. And because of our frustration, Pam, and our disgust, the devil wants us to believe that our faith is useless. But when you know that you will never, you can never go wrong when Jesus is praying for you. Look, when Jesus is praying for you, you will never go wrong. I don't care how bad the demon is. I don't care how rough it is. When Jesus is praying on your behalf, all you got to do is sit back and wait and watch, see God deliver on what the Lord is asking for you. She, she reaffirmed her faith in the relationship that, Je look, that Jesus held with the Father. And that's good news today because that relationship would fortify her relationship with Jesus. What gives you the strength to go on sometimes is knowing the, how close Jesus and the Father are. And when you realize how close they are, then you and him can be close. Y'all not saying nothing. She, she reaffirmed her faith and what could be for her life. Listen, even if she was unclear as to when the time frame would come about that she would see a change in her situation. Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And she says in verse 24, yeah, yeah, I know that. I, I, I know that. I know that, she said. He, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. She, she had a projection of faith that spoke to eternity. But Jesus wanted her to know that her expectation of faith doesn't have to wait to the sweet by and by. That you ain't got to die and get to heaven to experience what God wants for you to experience. You ain't got to die and get to heaven to see that new life can come to me right now. You ought to bump your neighbor real quick and say, I feel a shout coming on. And if you don't feel it, slide on down some because I feel something about that happening in my soul today. Amen. She had a projection of faith. He tells her in 25 and 26, look, 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 uh, uh, Martha, I am the resurrection and the light. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they. Woo! Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Then he says, do you believe this? Martha. I was intrigued, Deacon Ronda, because Martha was the only one in the crowd having a real conversation with Jesus. You do understand some folk just come and wait for him to do, while other folks say, talk to me a little bit, Jesus. Help me understand this, Jesus. See, your faith should be more than just hearing. Your faith should be inquiring. Your faith should be asking some questions. You ought to be mature enough in your faith to sit down and say, tell me because I don't understand. Help me understand. Talk to me. Amen. He, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And by letting her know that he is the resurrection and the life, he, he says, I'm able to revive your life in the right now. He didn't say, I will be the resurrection and the life. Yes. He didn't say I was. He said, I in the right now, God help us today, in the right now, I 
am what you need me to be. That's why God told Moses, just tell him I am that I am sent you. Whatever you need me to be in the moment, that's what I'll be. Is there anybody in church today who needs him to be your joy? He is your joy. You need him to be your peace? He is your peace. You need him to be your strength? He is your strength. Whatever you need God to be, he says, I am that I am. You need life? I am the resurrection and the life. God help us today. If even in the face of impossibility, he is declaring that my presence and my identity makes new life possible. And I need somebody who is staring right now at futility and impossibility and hopelessness just to reaffirm your faith to yourself and say, I know that God is still able. I don't care what they tell me. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. I know that God will come. Is there anybody in church today who still believes that God is God and God will be whatever God needs? To be? Somebody walked in here today, you need to reawaken your faith and tell yourself, I don't have to die because stuff in my life ain't good right now. God help. I, I don't have to get to heaven to experience this new level of living that God desires for me to live. I can have it right now. Why? He says, I am the resurrection. Look, I stepped in your dead moment to alert you to the fact that even though it's dead, I have come to bring you life. Is there anybody who hears the words coming up out of my mouth today? Somebody bump your neighbor and say, I hear that preacher up there talking to me. Look, if you're going to live against the odds, you first have to reaffirm your faith. Sometimes you got to tell yourself, self, we going to make it. <laughs> You got to tell yourself sometimes, I shall live and not die to declare the glory of the Lord. You got to remind yourself, as the people reminded me last night about Juneteenth, when they said, preacher, I left the Juneteenth service and told everybody, no weapon. You got to remind yourself sometimes that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Amen. But, but not only that, here's the hard part. Y'all shout on the front end. Y'all probably won't shout now. Here's the hard part. If you want to live against the odds, you have to revisit your pain. Okay. After the expressions of frustration over how Jesus came late, the, the true test now is presented to Martha. She, she reaffirmed her faith, Christina, but, but now... She has to revisit her pain. The tomb was the place where her hopes were buried. The place where her dreams were buried. The place where she laid to rest her future. The tomb signaled a past experience, painful one. And, and it was that place that she had to go back and revisit. Jesus asked in verse 34, okay, I heard all this stuff y'all telling me. And, and I'm looking at all this weeping going on around me and all this disbelief going on around me yeah. and all this stuff on. He says, where have you laid it? I, I, I ain't going to ask. I'm not going to ask you how you feel. I ain't going to ask you how bad does it hurt. He says, where have you laid it? And they say, now we don't know who the they are. We can't assume that they are Martha based simply upon how Martha responds when she gets to the tomb. So that they must be the professional mourners who are in the group. Because you do know there are some folk who are just professional. They go to everybody's funeral. Don't know who the person is. Crying on everybody's shoulder. Looking for a chicken dinner. I mean, some folk get a living off of the pain of other people. So some folk feel validated and useful in the pain. Talk, Reverend, of other people. Look, 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 look. He didn't ask her that. He just says, Where have you been? They said, Come on and see. Now, now, notice the progression. 
He, he asks, where is it? And they say, come and see. Now, I want to suggest to you today, now, as often as we've heard this story, as familiar as it is, I want to suggest to you today that Jesus already knew where Lazarus was. Yes. 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 He wasn't asking the question because he didn't know. Well, how do you know, Reverend? Because in the earlier part of the chapter, yes. he tells the disciples he's dead yes. before he died. Then he said, it's a good thing I wasn't there when he died. He hadn't even gotten there yet. So he knew, teach boy, he knew, his omniscience knew Lazarus was dead. So therefore, if he knew Lazarus was going to die and was dead before anybody else knew, then he knew where Lazarus was. So he wasn't asking where he was because he didn't know. He, he says, uh, 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 I want to know. Does this crowd, and do you, Martha, is your hope high enough that you are willing to walk back to the place of death and the pain that you find yourself in? God help me. Do, do, do you still believe to the degree that you can walk and go back to the place that caused you the most pain and believe that despite how painful it was, I can bring something out of the pain? It, it's not that I don't know where he is. I want to know, do you have enough courage to go back and look at the thing? God, help us today. That has caused you the most pain. Look, verse 4 says, remember now. He says, when he heard about Lazarus who was sick, he said, it will not end in death. No, his death happened for the glory of God. So that the Son of God may receive glory from all this. Then he says in verse 15, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. He didn't say, I'm glad I wasn't here after he died. He said, I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. For now, you will really believe. Come on. Let's go see him. Go see who? Let's go see the dead man. Jesus knew Lazarus was going to die before he died. Amen. So the idea here is not for him to gain knowledge. He, he was not trying to uh, be informed of, about Lazarus' location, but he was challenging the desire of Martha in the moment of her pain. Remember, Martha was the only one engaging him. She said, I believe. I know that God will give. Well, do you really? I know you say you got some faith. I know you say you believe God can do all things. I know you say God will never put more on you than you can bear. But do you really believe it when you got to deal with it up close and personal? She, she hears the question, Tony, and in my mind's eye, I can see her reluctancy and apprehension each step she took toward that tomb. Because here's the truth of the matter. None of us in this room, I don't care how saved you are, turn your halo down. I don't care how many scriptures you know, none of us in this room like to go back to revisit our places of pain. Get me as far away from it as you can. Don't let me deal with it no more. None of us like being forced to confront the places of our pain, but Jesus is letting us know that some revivals in our lives require us to go back and revisit the place. Sometimes you've got to go back in order to go forward. And truth be told, that there are some revivals, I don't care how much you try to avoid them, you're going to have to deal with your pain. You're going to have to go back and revisit. I know that Negro hurt you and left you brokenhearted, but sometimes you got to remind them, I ain't dead. You got to act like Joseph, what you meant for evil. God, I can't get no real Bible readers in church, amen, amen. Listen now, the place was barren. It was lifeless, it was cold, it was uninvited, it was a tomb. But Jesus says, take me to where you lay him. He didn't say, wait here until I get back. He didn't say, y'all go over there, I'm going to go over here. He didn't say, show me and let me go by myself. He said, no, I want y'all to come. Boy, that's pretty good. I want y'all to take me there. And, and therein is the good news. 
Because Jesus, Jonathan, wants to walk with you in the most difficult times of your life. He is not only letting Martha marry the crowd and the disciples know that he has a kind of power against all odds, but he's letting us know the very same thing today. The text encourages us by saying that if you have the courage to revisit the place of your pain, he, he will not let you walk alone, but he has the power to give you back what you thought you had lost. They move to the place of death. And Martha, now her fears have elevated. Because she says in verse 39, they, he says, roll the stone inside. Gee, Martha said, hold on. Hold on. He's been dead for four days. He's stinking. His body has now decomposed pretty much. Don't, don't, don't. Jesus, in other words, Jesus, don't make me go through this. Have you ever said, God, don't make me have to go through. Don't make me have to go through this one. Not this hurt. Not, not this pain. Not, not, not this level of discouragement. Don't let me have to go through this. It stinks in there. She's standing in her reality. But Jesus reassures her one more time that a long walk with me, Martha, will pay off in your life. Oh, boy, boy, I, somebody should have flipped their pew over. A, a long walk with him, it will pay off. In her fear, in her pain, the optimism she once showed has now been replaced with apprehension. She is struggling with the prospect of maybe, maybe my hopes have gotten too high and I'm going to be disappointed again. Because you do know I called you the last time and you ain't ever show up. I asked you to come last time and you wait the stuff got so bad. So how do I know you're not setting me up to fail, to be hurt? One more time. Boy, y'all looking at me like dead in headlights. How do I know? How do I know? Jesus says in verse 40, I know how you're feeling. This is John's translation. I know how you're feeling. And you got all these questions going on in your head right now. You're struggling with belief. He said, but didn't I tell you? I could stop right there. Because it don't matter what he told her. He said, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you? I didn't bring you back here to break your heart. I didn't bring you this far to leave you now. I didn't bring you back here to cause you some more heartache. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? He said, didn't you, didn't you hear what I said? Didn't I tell you? If you let me go with you, because I am the resurrection and the life, I will turn your stuff. God help us today. Is there anybody in church today who don't mind taking a long walk with Jesus because you want to stay at the end of that walk, I'm going to get my joy back. At the end of that walk, I'm going to get my peace back. At the end of that walk, I'm going to get my life back. Martha, he says, I, I didn't ask you to come this far to let you down. I realize it's taking some effort for you to face, this is my translation, to face this situation. But trust me when I say this to you, Martha. You will not be disappointed. That's a word for somebody in church today. Because Jesus is letting us know that if you have the courage to walk with him to your place of pain, you will not be disappointed. Folk may let you down, but God will never let you down. Folk may break your heart, but God will never break your heart. Folk may lie to you, lie on you, and lie in waiting for you. But God will be there for you to lift your con lift up your heads, O ye gates, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty, mighty in battle. I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Why? Because all of my help comes from the Lord. Remember, he says, I am the resurrection. You walking with life. God help us today. You are walking with new life. How in the world can you not live when you are walking with life? He, he gives her some reassurance. And, and then, listen, and then, and then 
Here it is, Micah. He steps into his role as an intercessor. <laughs> listen to what he said. He said he prays to the Father. He, he said he doesn't pray to God, listen, to raise Lazarus. You don't hear in the prayer where he says, God, raise up Lazarus. Y'all better read your Bible. He, he said he prays to confirm for Martha the power of a reaffirmed faith. He, remember she says, I know God will give you whatever you ask. Y'all remember that? Jesus says, Father, thank you for hearing me. Why would he say that? Because she said whatever. <laughs> Talk, boy. She said whatever God asks you, I know he'll give it. So he says, Father, I want to thank you for hearing me. Listen, you always hear me. God help us today. But, but, but I say this out loud for the sake of all these folks standing around me so that they will believe you sent me. He does not pray for Lazarus to come out the grave. He prays to reaffirm for Martha everything Martha had said in one little short sentence. He said, Father, thank you for hearing me. Somebody ought to get happy and say, God, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for hearing my mama's prayer. Thank you for hearing my daddy's prayer. Thank you for hearing my grandma's prayer. Thank you for hearing my name lifted in heaven. He says, Father, thank you for hearing me. I say this because you always and you do hear what I ask. And I'm not asking you this because to bless me, but I want to confirm for these folk that you sent me. Now, Martha, you want Lazarus to live? Let me help you. Lazarus, come on out of that grave. You ought to slap your neighbor and say he will do it. The, the prayer was not to revive a dead man. It was not to perform a miracle. It was to confirm for one person and to validate for everybody else that he was who he was. And every now and again, God will put you in a bad spot to confirm for you what he can do, but to validate for your critics what God is able to do. I need you to bump your neighbor real quick and tell your neighbor, you better stop playing with me because God just might have to prove something to you that you didn't know on your own. Is there anybody in church today who don't mind testifying? Boy, I feel like preaching right now. Who don't mind testifying? God will do what God, he will make you a believer at my expense. God help us today. Woo! What? Good God from Zion. When you read the story, only one individual seemingly has any kind of hope at all. And that was Martha. Her sister didn't have no hope. Well, how do you know? Because all she said was, if you had been here, we wouldn't be in this situation. I ain't got nothing to say to you. Leave me alone. Go on about your business. One person seemingly had faith. And Jesus was like, okay, since you're the only one out of all these folk in here, you ought to tap your neighbor and say, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? The only one out of all these folk in here, you're the only one who still believes I'm able. So because you believe, I'm going to break you off a little something, something to help them understand what I can do. I don't just talk arbitrarily. I am the resurrection and the life. God help us today. And I need to tell somebody, don't you bury your belief in what can be prematurely. Because it may look like it's over, but God sent me to tell you it ain't over until God pronounces that it's over. Jesus says, thank you for hearing me. You always. And since somebody still believes you hear me, I might as well fulfill their desire. Lazarus, come out. Now, we don't hear folks say that the reason he called Lazarus, because if he had just said come out, all the dead folk would have came out. And he ain't want all the dead folk coming out. He just, <laughs> he just want Lazarus. But, but, but I want to suggest to you today that, that he called Lazarus out because he wanted them to understand and wants us to understand. That whatever you buried, I have the power to bring it back to life. He called it by name. God help me preach. He called it by name. 
to let us know that whatever you bury, I can call your joy back. I can call your peace back. I can call your strength. Is there anybody in church today? We done now, but is there anybody here today who has some stuff that you buried that you need God to call back to life? Your joy back and your strength back and your vision back and your family back and your future back. Whatever is called, Jesus has the power to identify it and then to revive it. Her story is just like all of ours. We face some dark moments. We've had been dealt some undesirable hands. We've been forced to face some uncertain futures. But Jesus is willing to give you back everything that you lost during the course of your life. If you have enough hope, if you have enough faith, if you have enough belief that he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you ask, think, or imagine. If you have enough faith, to just believe that whatever you ask the Father, I just believe he will give it to you. You ought to shake your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I feel something staring down in my soul. I feel something staring down in the inside of my soul. I lost some stuff along the way. But if I have a reaffirmed faith, if I have the capacity to go back to the place of pain, I just believe that because God hears everything Jesus asks, I just believe that Jesus will call it by name and give it back to me. You ought to tap your neighbor and say, neighbor, you look like you a doubter, so slide on down some. But I'm still crazy enough to believe that God will do something ridiculous. God will do the miraculous. God will do the hideous just to let somebody know that God is still able. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I can give you another testimony because on Friday, they hung him high. On Friday, they stretched him wide. On Friday, they put a pierce in his side. But because he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he stayed dead on Friday. He stayed dead on Saturday. But even in his death, he was still the resurrection and the life. And on Sunday morning, I said on Sunday morning, on Sunday morning, God knocked on the tomb and told the rock, get out the way, because I got something to prove to all them skeptics, all them naysayers, all them doubters. I want to show them that even in death, I've got the power. Even in darkness, I've got the power. Even in hopelessness, I've got the power. Is there anybody here who showed up today who still believes I can live my life to the glory of God? I can stand. I can rise. I can give God the glory. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he give you back your joy? Won't he give you back your peace? Won't he give you back your strength? Somebody declare, I know he will, because he's an on-time God. He may not come when I want him, but he will always show up on time. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. 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 You can't tell me what my God can't do. You can't tell me what my God won't do. I know he woke you up this morning, but did he ever roll back a tomb? Did he ever give you back your life? Has he ever given you back your joy? Somebody ought to give God some praise. Yeah! Yeah! I know he's all right. I'm looking at some of y'all right now. And some of y'all should have been dead a long time ago. 
depression should have took you out, discouragement should have took you out, hopelessness should have took you out, but look at what the Lord has done. It is marvelous in our eyes. So don't you throw in the towel yet. You can still live. <laughs> you can still live. Despite not one odd or two odds, but you can live despite the odds. Because as long as he is still the resurrection and the life, and as long as God still answers his prayer, you can make it, you can take it, you can survive it, you can outlast it, you can outrun it. You can now distance it. You can look back at it and say, God, I thank you because the devil meant to kill me. But God, you caused me to survive. Is there anybody listening to me who has a survivor's anointing on your life? You should have been dead a long time ago. But look at you now. Still living. Despite all the mess going on in your life, still standing. Despite all the junk going on, still with a smile on your face. Ain't got but two nickels to rub together, but you know that God said, let the rich say, let the poor say I am rich, let the weak say I am strong. Bow your heads for a moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you, God, because you are still a God who defies the odds and because you defy the odds we can live against the odds because you still show up at critical times of our lives and all you ask us to do is to reaffirm our faith and what you're able to do and then to be willing to walk with you in our place of pain and we will leave the rest up to you God today I pray for my neighbor I don't know what they came in church with today that's burdening them down, that's causing them distress, that's making them believe that they can't survive. But God, I pray that you will lift that thing off them today in the name of Jesus. Give them an anointing that brings peace to their minds and their spirits. And help them, oh God, to live and to move and to believe that whatever Jesus asks you, you will respond. Help us to live in that assurance and help us to live in that promise because faith comes by hearing. And we heard Jesus say, didn't I tell you what I was going to do for you? Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of the Lord? And somebody's belief is on zero. But God now infused their belief with life. That it might register on the meter of faith. That they can now handle their life situations with courage and with determination and with expectation. Understanding and knowing that if you lead us and you guide us, you will provide for us. For the person today, God, who's listening to me, that does not have a relationship with you or a church home, oh God. Only you can change that situation. So we ask Jesus now to pray for them. We ask Jesus now to intercede on their behalf that they might come and give their lives to you on today. If they need a church home, this might be the place for them. But move now by your spirit. And we promise to give you the glory. 
In Jesus' name, we...